Good afternoon and welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for our virtual launch of the 2020 Writing from Inlandia Anthology. Today we are joined by contributors from all over the inland Southern California region and from as far away as Maine and the United Kingdom. My name is Janine Peroy Gamblin and I am Programs Coordinator for Inlandia Institute a literary and cultural arts nonprofit based in Inland Southern California. Before we begin, a few words. Inlandia respectfully acknowledges and recognizes our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air, the Cahuilla, Tongva, Luiseno, and Serrano peoples and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, the Inlandia region is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, and we express our gratitude to them for allowing us the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. And now a few housekeeping notes. We want you to know that closed captioning is available for this event via the CC icon on the lower part of your screen. Also, please note that this is a view only presentation and it is being recorded. And with that, I would like to introduce Katie Porter, Executive Director of Inlandia Institute, who is going to tell you a little bit about the anthology. Hi, Katie. Hi, Janine. And hi, everybody out there. And hi to all of our writing workshop friends. Um, I'm really proud to be here today. And we're doing this virtual event so that we can include some of our uh, workshop friends who are all ac around the world, very literally this year, the pandemic um, changed the way, as we all know, the way the world has operated and it's shrunk distances. So I have been uh, with Inlandia since about 2010. And the very first Inlandia anthology that we published was in 2011. So we, we actually marked 10 years of these anthologies this year's is special because it is the pandemic edition. And I don't know if you can see closely, but it has uh, the coronavirus in the background as does every piece that's included in this anthology. We've all written it within the, the framework of this year, which has been unlike any other we've experienced. And we dedicate this reading to our workshop friends that we have lost this past year, um, including Morris Mendoza, who was a part of Francis Vasquez's Tesoros de Cuentos workshop in the Casablanca neighborhood. Uh, Candice Shields, who was a part of our San Bernardino workshop under Romaine Washington and Allison Jafredo, and also uh, Selena Diana Bumpus, who uh, led the workshop at the Janet Gosky Senior Center, Poets in Motion. Um, so it has been a difficult year filled with loss, but also with connection. And so we are happy to be able to uh, be here today and share that connection with you and share these words. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Janine. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you. And so, Let's now get started with our program. And we're gonna begin with Francis Vasquez, our first reader. Francis is Inlandia Institute Director Emerita and writes about historical events and the Chicana Latino experience. She'll be reading from She Showed the Way, Reflections of Francisca Valenzuela, a biographical story that originated in the Tesoros de Cuentos workshop. Welcome, Francis. Thank you. My mother's mother, Francisca Valenzuela Burboa, was a strong independent Mexican woman who lived a full life, mostly the way she wanted. People in her village in Providencia, Sonora, called her Nana or Nana Pancha in deference and respect for her esteemed position as a proficient curandera y partera. A single parent, she was financially self-sufficient and supported others on her own meager earnings. She lived most of her life in a humble adobe home that would become her forever residence where she raised children, housed relatives, and stored her yervas and concocted her famous medicinal remedies. 
She knew the healing value and benefits of herbs. My Nana worked. Excuse my mom. My Nana worked as a respected Bartera, a midwife who helped the women in her village give birth. As a gifted curandera, a folk medicine woman, she specialized in treating babies and women with female ailments. She was famous for her special herbal remedies and healing massages. She usually made house calls. I heard stories of my grandmother wading across rivers to treat women and babies living in remote ranchos and campos to provide her services. Nana Pancha was the go-to midwife in Ciudad Obregón and Providencia. A Dr. Ramos offered to sponsor her to become licensed, but she declined, preferring to practice independently her way. Nana charged people whatever they could afford for her services. Sometimes they paid her with chickens and eggs. This was a new concept for Americana me, the notion that a raw egg was comparable to currency with which a person could exchange for goods and services. Wow, what a great economic system. The value of an egg at the time in the mid 1950s was 20 centavos. Many of my Nana's clientele were poor, so she usually had an ample supply of eggs in a bowl on her trastero or dining room cupboard. One day, I committed a bad deed. I stole one of her hard-earned eggs and took it to a nearby tiendita, a neighborhood mini market where I exchanged the egg for 20 centavos worth of cookies, which I ate all by myself. I didn't want witnesses to my crime. I never heard my nana or my mama uh, say anything about this. And I certainly didn't tell anyone about my sin, my secret foible. My ingrained Catholic guilt, however, kept me from ever doing it again. During my Nana's times, married Mexican women were obliged to be obedient and subservient to their husbands. My Nana would have none of that. So she never married, but she birthed two children, Uncle Chemali and my mother, Rosa Lidia. My Nana chose to follow her bliss, which was to devote herself to her demanding career, an occupation in which she excelled and was much sought after. One poignant story about Nana's fame was told to me by my beloved Tia Cuca. She said a man from a nearby campo arrived in Providencia searching frantically for La Nana Pancha. He heard about her expertise as a curandera who cured babies. He held his sick infant son in his arms and stated that doctors were unable to cure whatever ailed the baby. When she was informed that Nana had already passed away, the man burst into tears and lamented that Nana was his baby's last resort. I'm proud of my Nana Francisca Valenzuela Burboa. Because of her, innumerable women and children went on to live a healthy life. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you so much, Francis. Beautiful. Our next reader is Elizabeth Yuta, who is an award-winning poet based in London and is published in a variety of anthologies and journals. Today, she will be reading No Place to Be, a poem based on a true story of mishap while holidaying in Jamaica and The Stay, inspired by a lost in the woods prompt. Both poems originated during Selena Diana Bumpus's Poets in Motion. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. No place to be. The bus rattles away and is lost in the dark mumble of a place that isn't anywhere I know. Wait a bit. Tree frogs warble their joyous chant. There is slithering sin in the night grass to each side of the road and the buzz of the bulb hanging before the static police station. The rustle of clothes as I turn to look at my brother and he at me. Deep breaths, the exhaling hijacked by mosquitoes, squeezing, sneezing, breezing by. 
the stiff swish of two nodding heads. The middle of nowhere in a foreign land, past sundown, has the staccato beat of a movie soundtrack when foolish folk are entering a vampire's lair. We hold hands, warmth swarms out from our hands and becomes one with the stifling heat. We walk up creaking stairs, feet dragging against chipped wood. Then, on the floorboards of the porch, there is a single body in the shade, silent and still as a gun on a table. He shifts forward and up from his squishy chair. The light halos him a moment, and, and the flames are chittering about him. We see him in his uniform that is screaming out authority's name. I open my mouth. And, and I'm a lost as my words are in my dry throat. Wet, smickle of, wet smack of spittle allows me to say, we are lost. We took the wrong bus. My family's waiting for us. The long watching face of the cop lasts the length of a scratch of nails across a blackboard. He jerks his head for us to follow. And with it, there is a scrape of belted buckles and buttons that back him up. We drift like shadows into a ghost-like realm of bulletproof vests, knives, sprays, walkie-talkies, but no message home as of yet. He stands behind the grand desk and offer us two stools before him, a king in a court of complete control as his jaw twitches, vein throbbing loud. We scuttle forward like mice cornered between a cat and a trap. He unholsters his gun, leather stretches. He levels it at us. We gasp. My second poem is called The Stay. It was a darker day than night. Trees knitted together in tight coils, legs thick, an upright army that would not let us pass or so it seemed. We had to squeeze by as they creaked to catch at us with their twig-sharp, gnarling fingers. The leaves avenging scavengers, swooping down, sticking to our eyes, roots like sly feet ready to trip us up, the bark scritch scratching at us as we passed. We soldiered on. Who knew a forest could be so full of malevolence? And for what? The ground too offered resistance, diving us into sinking sand, stinking swamps, hellish with sulfur. Mosquitoes swung by with all their drinking buddies to sip from us. We were ripped, shredded, as if the tips of knives were at our throats. We arrived at a cottage, tumbled down roof, caved in walls, cracked door on the floor, and the dark beat of feet that had threaded through fire, when dampened leaving their mark, smears of ash to tell of a burning. We waited, warring with our instincts that said, move on, keep alert, it's a trap. We paused. The shattered domicile, foreboding as a ghost-filled graveyard, whistled. No wind coming through whining as if haggish beggars had come to town, mysterious as a Baba Yaga's hut on a single chicken's leg, capturing us, stopping us dead within its burnt offerings, consuming us. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Wow. And thank you for joining us from so far away across the sea. We're glad you could be here. Our next reader is Brian Franco. Brian is a gay Jewish 55 year old poet and spoken word performer from Brunswick, Maine. And he's actually presenting today from Maine. Uh, Brian will be reading from work developed during the Poets in Motion workshop with Selena Diana Bumpus. Thank you so much for being here, Brian. Thank you very much. Um... So the first is a set of four haikus called Four Haikus for 2020. Uh, one, the meaning of life is not about breathing, but deciding to breathe. Two, cynicism is an acquired attitude. No one is born that way. Three, optimism is more than just an idea. It can be mantra. 
or 2021 is the year of the poet because it makes sense. Um, the next poem is called Yardside and I'll just preface that a Yardside candle is a candle that Jewish people light on the anniversary of a loved one's death. It lasts for 24 hours. So this is called a Yardside. A Yardside candle burns for 24 hours. The candle is encased in what looks like a 12 ounce water glass type diners use to serve milk or a large juice. It is filled with white paraffin that has a faint odor of petroleum. The aroma doesn't permeate a room, but it is the kind of aroma that seems slightly disturbing. This candle will burn itself out with no danger to anyone. At the end of 24 hours, a burnt wick attached to a small metal washer sits at the bottom of a glass with traces of burnt wax residue. One could clean and scrub and wash the glass, then use it in the bathroom for taking aspirin or rinsing after brushing teeth, as if it did not represent the life of a relative, as if Kaddish wasn't recited as it was lit, as if no one knew the glass they drank their juice from or the glass that held milk they used to dip Oreos in, held paraffin that slowly melted away, representing memories and history and a life that lives on. And finally, um, this one I would like to read in honor of Selena, Selena Diana Bumpus, or because she was a truly wonderful person who I, I can't say enough about her. Um, and I think that she was, it's called a most honorable warrior's death. And I think she was, she was a warrior for all of her students. She was, she just took, she took care of us all in a special way. So a most honorable warrior's death. So many poetry people I know have said, Poetry has saved their lives. The same story is told in a million different voices around the world. Poets are warriors. Poets are fighters. Poets are Olympic pugilists. Our enemies, our nemeses, our sparring, par our sparring partners are simultaneously our mirrors and our pasts. Our present tense existences are fleeting moments in which we contemplate lives, decisions, relationships, families. Our words run through veins to hearts and through nerves to brains. We spit them out as poetry, exposing them to the elements, sending them to a glorious death, memorialized on page to be read both out loud and in silence, not only by us, but also others who have experienced pieces of our lives in their separate lives. Their epitaphs are our epitaphs. Our poetry is a graveyard that transforms death into life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. I think poetry can save lives too. I've thought that more than once. Beautiful. Our next reader, reader number four, is Randy Kiros, who was a finalist in the 2020 International Writers of the Future Contest and won the Top Fiction Award at the 2019 San Diego Southern California Writers Conference. Today, he will be reading the start of a story about keeping too many possessions called The Hole in My Life, which he workshopped with Tim Hatch and the Ontario Writing Workshop. Welcome, Thank Randy. Thank you very much. The Hole in My Life. My wife, Deb, and I had a problem. We kept too many things. As our household clutter grew, I began to wonder, could this be how hoarders start out? We had rules for cleaning up when our kids lived at home. Those were in place, so we set a good example. But after they moved away, we got lazy. We'd leave things out and go to bed. We'd make a mess and decide to pick it up later. We got sloppy. Two family deaths left us tons of extra possessions. Deb had a job, so as the unemployed one, sorting through all the precious junk fell to me. Of course, I procrastinated. Sure, I knew to keep certain things like photographs and family heirlooms, but I risked angering Deb if I made a poor choice, and no amount of I trust you from her set me at ease. I also had to make sure not to throw away any, anything we might need. We couldn't afford to just go out and buy a new one, whatever it might be. I moved most of it to our backyard, even emptying the pool to create more storage space. Then the seasonal rains arrived. I had to quickly cram things into every available spot inside the house. I asked my wife, Someday it isn't raining. Could we maybe have a yard sale? No, sweetheart. I don't want the entire neighborhood to see our throwaways. It's so cheap looking. The kind of thing that screams low-class neighbor. 
Despite negative comments from friends and family, we felt no obligation to keep our living space like anyone else thought we should. I think we got even messier out of spite. As time passed, our problem grew worse and we stopped letting anyone inside. Stacks and piles formed in every room and we kept adding to the problem. Despite having so much stuff, we never left food or anything odorous around. We were messy, but neither of us could tolerate filth. We rationalized that standard made it all okay. Among our treasures, we had extensive collections of leftover pieces and valuables, paperwork and unread mail, tools and kitchenware, magazines that might contain that one article we wanted, artwork from our kids in grade school, letters from friends and relatives, that table and bookshelf we might need someday, newspapers with headlines that might one day interest grandkids, unfinished crafts and art projects, and all our books from college classes we'd attended over 20 years ago. We had it all. Eventually, the stacks grew so large we could only get from room to room following tight, treacherous pathways that often left us bruised as we wound our way through them. The stacks grew taller until we could no longer use the ceiling fans and much of the house fell into darkness, making it mandatory we keep flashlights regularly interspersed throughout. Falling debris became a constant danger, so we had to move slowly through the increasingly narrow routes weaving through our house or risk an avalanche. Then I got an idea. I rented a jackhammer and took it to our basement. After clearing a space, I thought, is this crazy? But I had to do something. So I broke through the foundation and cleared away enough space for digging, which was difficult, but I developed a routine. Each day after Deb left for work, I'd excavate and shovel dirt. At first, I spread around the yard and put some in the bottom of our garbage cans, figuring the pickup crew wouldn't notice. They didn't. That worked for a while, but eventually I had to make dump runs. Fortunately, we'd figured landfill visits into our budget for getting rid of things. At the end of each day, I'd run the backyard hose through the washroom window and down into the basement. I'd water down the area where I planned to dig next. Eventually, I dug deep enough that I had to lower a ladder into what I'd come to call the hole. When I reached 10 feet below our basement floor, I branched out to one side. After only a month, I excavated the equivalent of a medium-sized room. And though it seemed pretty solid, the possibility of collapse worried me. Online, I researched how mines were shored up professionally. I couldn't afford the oversized lumber they used, so I made do with less, emptying my stockpile of unused and leftover wood, supplementing that with whatever I could get from friends. I'd say I was building a fence or a doghouse or whatever it took to accumulate the lumber to make the space as safe as possible. At one point, I even destroyed some inherited furniture for the wood it would provide. After tamping down, flattening the earth beneath my first underground room and leaving enough space to dig more, I ran wiring to provide power for lights and whatever else. I hung split open garbage bags on the walls and laid them flat on the floor to provide a moisture barrier. Then I threw rug remnants down and moved things in. And for the rest, you'll have to read the book. Thank you so much, Randy. We can't wait to. <laughs> Um, I, I, our next reader is Barry Cutler, who has been a professional actor in theater, television, and film for more than 50 years, but a baseball fan for more than 60. His story, Barry Cutler, Major League Baseball Player, or Why Not, The Greatest Story Ever Told, originated in Tim Hatch's workshop just as the 2020 baseball season began. Welcome, Barry. Thank you. 2020 Major League Baseball season was the oddest of seasons. Thanks to a pandemic, each team played only 60 games. For most of the season, due to the dangers of COVID-19, very few fans were allowed in the stands. The Dodgers decided to take advantage of that and charge fans up to $299 to have cardboard cutouts of themselves in the stands for the entire season. As I was still a big baseball fan, I bought one, and I was lucky enough to get my cardboard cutout, a seat right behind home plate. And then, toward the end of the regular season, when the Dodgers held a contest for several lucky fans to attend the final game in person, I was one of the winners. So, on September 27, 2020, in a game against the Los Angeles Angels at Dodger Stadium, I was there in person. All the Dodgers had to do was win that one game to end up second in the Western Division of the National League. However, if they lost, they would be out of the competition for the championship. 84-year-old Sandy Koufax threw out the ceremonial first pitch. 
And then, then he sat in a stands, socially distanced six feet to my south. The game was a real nail biter. Only of course, nobody was biting their nails because of the virus. The Dodgers went into the top of the ninth inning, leading the Angels by only one run. With one out in the top of the ninth, the Angels had the bases loaded. The batter lined the ball toward the pitcher. While the pitcher managed to catch the ball, he tripped and fell as he lobbed the ball home to prevent a run from scoring. There were two outs in the top of the ninth and the bases were loaded. The Dodgers were only one out away from winning the division, but the pitcher had been injured. He had broken his leg, stumbling to catch the ball. So this was the problem. The virus had run rampant throughout the season, badly impacting on every team. For the Dodgers, it had wiped out every pitcher, but, uh, but the one who had just been injured. There was nobody left to try to get the final batter out except sitting six feet to my left, there was Sandy Koufax, the greatest pitcher in baseball history. Manager Dave Roberts approached and said, Sandy, we need you. It's only one batter, will you pitch for us? Sandy turned red, looked down at his feet and muttered, no, I can't. Why, asked Roberts, I've seen you out there before the games training our pitchers. You've still got it, please. Sorry, said Sandy, I just can't. Why, Roberts pleaded, at the same moment I turned to Sandy and asked, why? Because, said Sandy, it's Yom Kippur. No, I cried, not again. Sandy looked at me kindly and asked, are you Jewish? I was Jewish, just like you. And I'm a Southpaw, just like you. But I'm an ag agnostic now. Funny, he said, you don't look agnostic. Well, I replied, somewhat embarrassed, I am. Well then, said Sandy, well then, why don't you pitch, kid? Hand him the ball, Dave. And I climbed down out of the stands and Dave Roberts handed me the ball. And over the transistor radio strategically placed throughout the ballpark, I heard Vince Scully say, Roberts is walking a young 73 year old guy named Barry Cutler out to the mound and giving the kids some last minute advice. Every other fan in the stand, all 12 of them, are lighting matches as he takes the mound to, sh to face Mike Trout, the best player in baseball. Cutler looks in for a sign. He checks the runners. He sets and he throws directly over the top exactly like Sandy Koufax. And Trout lined the pitch straight back directly at my head. I raised my glove shouting, oh shit. And my words rang out through the empty ballpark echoing at the television sets across the land. And Cutler catches the ball, Scully shouted from the transistor radios. The Dodgers win! The Dodgers win! Sandy jumped out of the stands and embraced me. I had indeed followed in my hero's footsteps. The entire Dodger pitching staff quickly recovered. It turned out that the, pitcher, the day's pitcher had just twisted an ankle. And the team went on to win their first World Series since 1988. The day after the final game of that series, at the same hour, on the same day, Sandy and I died of the virus we had shared during our embrace, but we died happy. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. That was wonderful. Okay. Um, our next reader is also from the UK. It's Nina Lewis, who is a poet and who took the Poets in Motion classes with Selena Bumpus. The poems in the anthology were all pieces from this course. Today, Nina will be reading Homing Birds, Alkaline, No Network Connection, and Kite. Thank you for joining us today, Nina. Thank you, thanks for having me. Um, just wanna echo what Brian said. It was a complete joy knowing Selena, Diana, and um, you know, she's truly missed. This is called Homing Birds. There is pleasure in admiring birds, a lot to learn of trust. She yearns for the freedom to spread her own wings, escape the city. She wants to prove to her son, there is no need to be afraid. Labels come from fear. Like xenophobia, and the slow acceptance of foreigners on these cobbled squares. She wants to teach him how to belong to place, 
that it's okay to be different, to be surrounded by flight. And my next poem, Alkaline, um, uses white space a lot. A promise written on water will simply float away. Invisible words without record, no echo of your swirling hand. Traceless, the water has moved on. Wild swimmers are on their second drafts, trespassing through water, one word at a time. And this one's called No Network Connection. You are inoperable. I click the link of you and get error 404. You no longer exist, except I know you do. It's me who's blocked, locked out, shunned. You are outdated. Haven't bothered with your upgrade truth 2.0. If you had, you would know your view of all of this is skewed. But we're both screwed on this connection because the server's down. There are ghost pages, little fictions I'm creating to fill in the gaps, your carnage left behind. That lingering reminder of what happens when someone gets it wrong. The lines of communication broken. And I'll finish with Kite. She floats along the deck. The boat has no sails, holds no superstition. She takes thermals upwards and glides into cloud wisps of air. Doesn't look down. She never liked heights. She wonders how to descend, wriggles out of her parachute skirt, turns head down, arms dart steady, expects to plunge. Finds she has plume power, is rocking backwards, forwards. She knows they'll wait with ropes to bind her like some village giant. Misunderstood. The choice is air, sky or people, land. The place of family wins every time. She lets them reach her, grab her feet and hands. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nina. We're so glad you could be here to read that today. I am loving this. What a great way to spend a sad Sunday afternoon. I think it's wonderful. Our next reader is Nan Friedley, who is a retired special education teacher living in Riverside. Nan has participated in several Inlandia workshops, and today she's going to be reading two poems that also originated in Selena Diana Bumpus's online workshop through the Gosky Center. I should say with her workshop, she may have done a different one, but that's what I'm thinking it is, um, Nan. Uh, one is called Ode to the Lobe, which is a tribute to the earlobe, and Six Pack of Senrus, which are six haiku-like poems, but they're about human nature. Is that right, Nan? That's right, thanks, Janine. Okay. First one, Ode to the Lobe, Lobulus Auriculi fleshy lower part of an external ear. Some dangle, unattached free spirits, liberated to wag in the wind by a common inherited trait. Fewer are attached directly to the head. Small, hangless lobes belong to introverts, always looking to the future. Either kind is a handy place to hang silver hoops, pierce to post diamond earrings, pearls to pass down from grandma. And the next is a series of little senryus, six pack of senryus it's called. And the first one is called Limit One. Eyes above a mask search barren shelves for that last roll of paper towels. Second one, through his window, happy birthday, dad, celebrate 92 years in your room alone. Third one, flight 1412 sitting between two masked men, wondering which one tested positive. 
Next one, new normal. Waiters wearing masks, fine dining in parking lots, tables under tents. Zoom school. Checkerboard children, microphone muted, eager to wave hello. Halloweenless. Trick or treat canceled. No COVID candy for me. Still wearing my mask. Thank you. Thank you, Nan. Thank you so much. You've got me thinking that we need to remind people you can get the anthology. Because I'm, I'm thinking I'd love to spend more time with these poems and stories we're hearing. And at some point, we'll get up the link in case you want to purchase a copy of the um, anthology from 2020, which is wonderful. Our next up reader is Helen Young. Helen also attended the Poets in Motion workshop with Selena Diana. Helen graduated with a BA in English literature and has worked as an academic department secretary, among other things. The title of one of her poems is The Air We Breathe, and the other two are short triolet poems. Welcome, Helen. Glad you could be here today. Thank you so much. Um, this is terrific, and I want to say to start out with hello to Liz Uter, and hello to Brian Franco, and hello to Nina Lewis, who were all, all in the um, um, in our workshop of Poets in Motion with Selena Diana Bumpus. So uh, it's meeting up with old friends here. It was wonderful. Um, okay, the, the poem, The Air We Breathe, was not written in the um, workshop, but uh, I, I kind of liked it. I, I wrote it for some sort of ecological contest, um, but so here it is. The Air We Breathe. Two ways to look at the air we breathe. One, the visible air, the exhaust and exhalations, noxious effluence carelessly released, smog, soot, dust commingled. Do we care about the moms, dads, kids who live near smokestacks, rumbling trains, the stalled cars on crowded freeways? Do we care? Another way to look at air is closer to the spirit more ethereal, the fragrance of kindness, the kind deed, a smile, a door held open, the silent prayer for others in the grocery store, the bank line, at the takeout counter, those cherished interregnums in the daily grind. One kind of air we receive only good or bad. The other is our choice to give. Are we sending this pure fragrance aloft in our atmosphere? It must most surely and certainly help. Second part, how is the air we breathe? How is our kindness quotient going? How's our neighborhood friendliness going? Are we caring for others? St. Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being. He must surely have meant this literally. If this is so, how are our thought processes going? Are we exuding kindness? Purity, selflessness? Yes, it does require a lot. Our atmosphere of thought equals the atmosphere we breathe. A one-to-one -one correlation. How are we doing in this exercise? And part three. Young activists, thank you for your patience, your resilience and honesty, your truth-telling. To Greta Thunberg, 18-year-old Swedish climate activist and radical truth teller to power, and to all the young and old who respond to her call for action. The air we breathe will respond to our united action. We can care more. Si se puede, yes we can. Things will surely get better all the way around. Let's work to make it so. That's one, thank you, and then, two triolet poems. Um, and these um, have a certain rhyme scheme. It goes A, B, A, 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 B, A, B. So the first one is called The Cat Once In. The cat once in, the cat once out. Is there no satisfying this feline friend? Its motivation leaves some doubt. The cat once in, the cat once out. Make up your mind, you want to shout. 
to no avail, it won't attend. The cat wants in, the cat wants out. Is there no satisfying this feline friend? And then the last one is summer idol. Echoes from a summer pool when days are long and sun enshrined. The kids are free and home from school. Echoes from a summer pool. These sounds unbind me from time's rule and memories flow, both clear and kind. Echoes from a summer pool when days are long and sun enshrined. Thank you so much, Helen. Beautiful, wonderful work. All right, our next, oh, for a second I had a panic thinking I forgot to turn off my mute. So here I am starting over. <laughs> With your introduction, Robin. Robin Longfield is our next reader. She's a native of Shambly, Georgia, but has called the Inland Empire home for over 30 years. Her essay, Time Out of Mind, was inspired by the way her notorious issues of not understanding the way other sea time has impacted her and the ones around her. The story began in Dr. Carlos Cortez's Chronology Land workshop, but was developed further during Joe Scott Coe's Riverside Library workshop. So thank you and welcome, Robin. Thank you. This is more like the wine reduction than a, the bottle of wine. So, no one who knows me would ever dispute that my relationship with time is complicated. Were I to have my own personalized timepiece, I am certain it would feature wings, hands that move backwards, and numbers of different sizes arranged in a chaotic fashion. Pokey, as in the children's book, The Pokey Little Puppy, may be the kindest word my friends and family have used when recounting what it was like visiting museums or other places with me. I am certain my daughters, Ariel and Mia, had their own nomenclature for what they felt about their adventures with me. I am grateful that those words have been consigned to the secretive, sacrosanct language of sisters. Because extra money was often scarce when Ariel and Mia were growing up, I was always on the lookout for free or nearly free educational places to which my husband, Mr. Sunshine, and I could take them on weekends. My favorite source was the calendar section of the Los Angeles Times. Museums, book fairs, and festivals, all of it was there. Every Sunday morning, I would scour over that section of the paper with the same fervor Mr. Sunshine, Ariel, and Mia spent trying to take it away from me or pretend that it never arrived in the first place. I saw the events in the calendar section as an opportunity for great adventure. Mr. Sunshine and Mia viewed them quite differently. They looked at them as less time that they could spend watching their favorite reruns of CSI New York and Law and Order SVU. I'm having a problem with my page. Oh no. Okay, I'm back. Ariel thought that this would be less time climbing trees or rollerblading. Perhaps these days would be remembered with more affection had just a few little things about them been slightly different. First of all, had the events been closer to our home in Colton, perhaps around the block instead of an hour's drive in each direction. Secondly, had I not been born with the circadian rhythm of a vampire, only Dracula could have been more averse than I was to the concept of mourning. Lastly, had I even the slightest ability to exist on a time continuum that was even remotely close to that of the rest of my family. They may have been operating on earth time, but I was orbiting in a completely different galaxy. No matter the destination, three fourths of my family abided by what we referred to at the, as the Ed DeVevick's diner philosophy of eat and get out. 
Unfortunately, the remaining fourth viewed everything, even in a children's museum, as though there would be a quiz on every object before entry to the next section could be granted. The guarantee of a trip to the bakery at Tanner's Deli afterwards helped somewhat, but even payment in high hats, black and whites, and hamantaschen had its limits. After a while, I had to throw in Starbucks too. Hmm. Thank you, Robin. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, our next reader is Mary Joan Kerper. Mary Joan Kerper has been widely published and has held many jobs as well, including professional musician, athlete, detective, and licensed transpersonal psychotherapist. Active in Inlandia since 2009, she led the Art and Heart Memoir online workshop last spring. The following story, Perspective, Empty Shelves, Riots, and Chaos, emerged during that workshop. And welcome, Joan. Thank you. This is wonderful that you're doing this uh, because I miss the in-person event. Uh, okay. Really, Eddie, I said to my brother on the phone, with our COVID-19 restrictions, I've only been to two grocery stores a few times, but I was starting to freak out seeing the empty bread shelves. I couldn't understand why. It wasn't just the fact that the shelves were stripped bare. I realized I was having flashbacks, part of something larger. At first, I couldn't figure it out. Then my mind's eye went to I saw it all as clear as day where I lived through it before and why it was so profound. Mary Joan, we've never lived through this before. There's never been a time in my life, especially in the stores, he said sternly with his, I worked in retail all my life and I know what I'm talking about voice. Don't tell me what I remember or know Eddie, I retorted in an equally firm voice. Suddenly it occurred to me why he might not remember. Eddie, my only sibling, half sibling actually, is seven years older than I. Eddie, when were you in the army? He thought a moment, 1967 to 1969. Then you weren't home in Michigan when it all happened. You were out of the country. When what happened, he queried. The Detroit race riots were in July of 1967. In addition to so much destruction downtown, city and er, suburban grocery stores, among others, and the whole region were practically cleared. People panicked. The same thing happened in 1968. People were frantic. In, Ap in April, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Then in June 1968, Robert F. Kennedy made the, made the, met the same fate. Two of our top civil rights leaders murdered. All hell broke loose. People were terrified that tyranny was at country's door. In 1968, I saw the panic up close and personal. I was, a wor I was working for Ori Bakery as a flyer, I started. It was one of my part-time jobs in undergraduate school. After delivering flowers to Mortuary's Church and other customers for Burrell Flowers, owned by our dear Uncle Gordon, I'd drive my little 1965 Seafoam Green BW Bug to five area grocery stores in the afternoon, in quote, flying for Ori Bakery. My job was to make sure the bread and baked good shelves were neat and fully stocked. Walking into the stores after the assassinations was shocking. The emptiness of the shelves and the commotion. People were stocking up, hoarding, rushing, crushing, and yelling, pushing overloaded carts. At first, I was unprepared to be in the middle of it. When customers saw my uniform and realized there would be more baked goods out in a few minutes, they'd surround me. I was given a hero's welcome. Oh, it was chaotic. I spent extra time at different stores to help out unofficially because they needed me. 
we were stalking and working as fast as we could. I have great empathy for how hard the grocery workers are toiling right now during COVID-19. To top it all off, in 1968, I was deeply grieving the loss of my two heroes, Martin Luther King Jr. and Bobby Kennedy. I saw Bobby killed in real time via television, just like his brother. JFK assassinated when I was 14 in real time via TV. You know, John F. Kennedy was the first politician I campaigned for. I don't remember that, said Eddie. Long story short, I always honored that I worked in the grocery store environment. I learned a lot about it, even though it wasn't a long stint and I wasn't part of the full-time staff. It was intense, demanding, required crisis intervention skills. But until I walked into the grocery stores during this COVID-19 crisis, I would buried most of the emptiness and bedlam of that time. It's understandable, really, compared to all the other roles and experiences I've had in my adult life. When I think about it, what a powerful time. Huh, I didn't know that, Eddie said. We went on to talk about how the rest of his family was doing, caught up and said our, love, our, lo uh, said our I love yous. Our conversation was enlightening. It helped me articulate the source of those unsettling PSTD systems. PTSD symptoms. Once again, the sight of swaths of empty shelves came flooding back, carrying with them the memories <clears throat> and sensations, excuse me, <clears throat> and perilous, terrifying times. The hangings and beatings of Black people, the Cuban Missile Crisis, freedom and civil rights marches, the women's marches, the death of a classmate in the Vietnam War, seeing in quote highlights from the war aired nightly on the news and protests against it. The Kent State Massacre, the serial murders by the co-ed killer John Norman Collins in Michigan when I was an undergraduate. And those were only the start. One sensation triggered another. I, it reminded me of how critical perception and perspective is. Not having gone through two major community and national events as they were unleashed and, in, and the aftermath, Eddie felt his memory was correct. To him, the nation had not been through anything like COVID-19 generated before, but it has. I was lucky. Um, thank you so much. I hate to interrupt, but we're um, about a minute and a half over time. So I'd just like to encourage folks to finish reading oh, that incredible oh, essay. That's the best part. If I knew that, I would have. The last okay. part is the important part. The really okay. important part. So anyway. All right. Well, please go, go find it and read it. And Joan, thank you so much for being here. We're very glad to have you. Yes, thank you so much. Such powerful stories. Um, I'm, I'm just loving them. We have uh, our next reader is going to be Will Clark. Will Clark was born in Africa to American parents and spent his first 20 years there. He spent one summer in the second largest city in Zambia while he earned his college expenses by selling books. See him in Cycling in Ndola, 1961, riding a racing bike down city streets. How did I do with the pronunciation there, Will? Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I too was a student under Selena Diana Bumpus. Uh, I think she had a big influence on our group. During the summer of 1960 to 61, I was a coal porter selling books in the city of Ndola, Zambia to earn tuition for college the next year. A generous stranger heard of my project and that I needed wheels to get around. He offered to lend me his bicycle since he planned to be out of town for the summer. It was a real beautiful racing bike made of ultralight aluminum. The handlebars reached out and then curved down in true racing style so that when I wanted to go fast, I could clutch the lower parts bend my whole body to make the least wind resistance and put the most force on the pedals. The pedals were permanently in high speed mode, making climbing hills tough. 
but regular street riding fast. I rode along with them, uh, sorry. One time I was riding down the street where cars were going fairly fast. I rode along with them and out of curiosity, I pulled into the center of the street and rode up next to the car going my speed. I peered into the window at the car speedometer. I was doing over 40 miles per hour. The driver looked up and about had a heart attack to see a cyclist overtaking him and close enough for him to touch. The extra light rims and tires were very narrow and rounded so I could lay the bike over for cornering and they wouldn't let go of the pavement. One time, I needed to turn across the oncoming lane of, tra of traffic. I should have slowed down, but I sped up. And as soon as the oncoming car went past me, I laid the bike over really hard. Ahead of me, the curb came at me with blinding speed. I slammed hard on the rear brake, expecting the wheel to lock and the back tire to slide around so I wouldn't hit the curb head on. Indeed. The back wheel locked, but clung tenaciously to the tar. I cra crashed, taking bunches of skin off. Then I looked at the bike. The rear, be the rear wheel had bent almost at a right angle. Oh no, were my first thoughts. What's the owner gonna say about my wrecking his bike? I sat on the curb with the wreck in my lap. I was a long way from my apartment and I didn't want to carry the bike all that way. I grabbed the rear rim with both hands and stuck my knee into the hub. Then I pulled with all my might. Being of that light material, the wheel straightened out nicely. Uh, no, not nicely, but it straightened out enough so that it would actually turn. Part of the time it would rub on the left rear fork and part of the time on the right rear fork. I got on and it held me. I found I could ride it. It wound a snaking trail down the road, squealing and squeaking, but at least it made progress. I went directly home. My landlady took pity on me, washed and bandaged my wounds and served me tea. The next day, I took it down to a bicycle shop. The mechanic looked at it in dismay. Then he put it in a vise and got out his spoke tool and spent an hour tightening and loosening the appropriate spokes to bring the wheel back to true. Finally, he gave me back the bike. That's the best I can do, boss. You need a new wheel. Well, do you have a new wheel? I queried, knowing full well I didn't have enough cash to pay for one. No, boss, that's a very special bicycle. But it will go now without rubbing on the forks. Thanking him, I paid him and snaked the bike back home. I continued selling books for the rest of the summer, but rode much more sanely and carefully from then on. It was, it was through my landlady that I had borrowed the bike. I never met the bike, bike's owner. When the summer ended, I left the bike with my landlady with a note of thanks to the bike's owner and an offer to pay for fixing his bike. He responded that he never rode the bike anymore and didn't really want to ride it again. He didn't want me to pay, for it, pay him for it. I have eternal gratitude to both my landlady and the bike's owner. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will. Wonderful story. Thank you. Our next reader is Sylvia Clark. Sylvia has played with words since she was a child and enjoys writing memoir and poetry. Petition and Song, the poem she is reading today, was completed and polished in a class taught by Selena Diana Bumpus. Another from that wonderful influence. Sylvia, your, your mute is still on, just to remind you before you, um, started speaking. There you go, already. Okay, thank you. Petition in song. How can I praise you, Lord? How can I raise you, O Lord, where you belong in heart and song? How can I please you today? Come, Lord, and fill my mind with your gentleness so kind. 
So all I meet, I'll surely treat as your children on the way. Your love runs very deep. Your power able to keep my steps aright both day and night. Strengthen me now to obey. May I be quick to hear, slow to anger and fear. Guard what I say. Teach me to pray. Forever friends, let us stay. Forever friends in your sway. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Our next reader is Dinaz Coach Builder. Dinaz is a <clears throat> educator, environmental advocate, wife, mother, and grandmother. She will be sharing an essay entitled Timeless Music written as a result of a prompt, look back in time, and then return to the present, um, as given in Carlos Cortez's workshop, Adventures in Chronology Land. Welcome, Dinas. Thank you, Janine. And happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Timeless music. It was Seattle in the summer when the city is a magnet for entertainment of all times. My favorite, is the Seattle Symphony that's a permanent inhabitant of the truly beautiful Benaroya Hall. It takes my husband, Feroz, and I half an hour to get from our condo to our seats well before curtain call. It was 2016. The music director was Ludovic Morolo. The opening piece of the recital was to be the overture to Wagner's Tannhauser, according to the program that I had perused. The overture is one of my favorites and I was looking forward to the evening. We stood respectfully for the national anthem, then settled comfortably into our seats. The overture opens with a very slow, sustained crescendo. It represents pilgrims approaching ever louder as they journey towards Rome. Suddenly, tears welled into my eyes and start coursing down my face. Embarrassed, I try to wipe them away unsuccessfully. I am instantaneously transported on the wings of music across a span of decades to a quiet family dinner in our Mumbai, India home. My father, Barjor, mom, Freni, and brother, Shahrukh, and I are beginning dinner, seated at the long black glass topped dining table. The crystal chandeliers drop sprinkles of light onto the smooth glass top. Ceiling fans cool the evening. No noise from the garden outside disturbs us. <clears throat> it is my responsibility, one that I delight in, to select and arrange about four long playing records that the record player will play sequentially. That night, the first musical piece is Tannhauser. We cherish these weekday dinners as a family. This is a time when we share the experiences of our busy day and feel a sense of closeness. I was back again in the arms of my family, nostalgia staining my wet cheeks with the musical chords of that familiar overture reverberating in my soul. Why was I crying? It's hard to tell. There was a deep sadness that filled every pore of me. Perhaps I missed the family togetherness of those days. My father introduced me to the world of classical music. We had explored Wagner together while reading The Lord of the Rings. 
I left India in 1967 on a journey to the US with the goal of continuing my studies. I did not know that I would never see my dear 22 year old brother and only sibling again. He was my trusted and best friend. His was an accidental death in Yana Lake, Mahabaleshwar in 1968. Over the years, I returned to Mumbai with my own family, my husband and two sons to spend the summers with my parents. I missed his presence. Perhaps it was a recognition of the long journey I had taken like Tannhauser's pilgrims halfway across the world to the other side of the planet. Back at Benaroya, I succeeded in shaking, choking back those tears, patting my face with a now soaking tissue and reaching out to hold Feroz's hand for comfort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dina. I loved hearing that story, and I'm I'm familiar with it to some degree. It was nice to hear it more expanded. Um, we have another reader coming up here. It's Mark Grinier, who has been writing and publishing poetry in various magazines for more than 50 years. The poem he will be reading was created for one of James Ducat's poet workshops, rather, and is called Cooking. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Um, this poem, Cooking, it has a little epigraph called When the Band Cooks, the Music Rocks. Uh, here it goes. In the fall of night, as a hot stove cooks, green peppers halved, deceited, sliced, mixed with fresh red onions peeled, cut into halves, then rings and chopped, sauteed, tayed with seasoned chicken breast strips. Fajitas tonight that I cook now for myself and my wife, reversing the roles of our years together. We're making do as best we can while autumn days grow shorter again. The music plays from our home pod now instead of from dance or concert stands or even in quiet social scenes where diners share space and well-made meals in public rooms away from homes. At home tonight, where hummingbirds hover to feed from flowers and autumn vines, the music comes from calling birds or from a cell phone we have set on the table outside on our back porch, away from friends and families, away from all that's become a threat to health and life, to happiness, to lives once lived without these masks when bands still cooked and rocked the night. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Beautiful. Okay, we are closing in on the end of our program. We have three readers yet to come. Um, coming up next is Rick Champion, who is going to be um, signing in from San Francisco. So Rick uh, contributes stories and illustration for Natalie's zine. You will meet Natalie very soon. Rick will read excerpts from The Blessing of the Bikes, a story about the places that his bike has taken him, written in Chronology Land with Carlos Cortez. Welcome, Rick. Thank you very much. The Blessing of the Bikes, Los Olivos. Los Olivos might have been, at one time, a working olive orchard. The soil was sandy and rocky, brought down by floods from the San Gabriel Mountains. Or the olive trees could have been planted as landscape when a government agency built affordable duplexes. Whatever their origin, the trees provided summertime shade. The trees dropped small black and bitter fruit. In Spain and Greece, I learned that the olives had to be aged in brine to be edible. The trees felt at home in Upland. Los Olivos was Upland's barrio. 
I rode my bike from home to home, leaving newspapers on doorsteps. Mrs. Hernandez insisted, come in. I won't pay you unless you come in. I was shy, but I wanted to be paid. When I crossed the threshold, seven daughters were lined up, oldest to youngest. Seven giggle attacks. As I took my money and ran, Mrs. Hernandez scolded. You scared him. I understood Spanish. Parking places in Los Olivos were crowded with classic Fords and Chevys, all lovingly decorated. They had moon hubcaps, lots of chrome, fringe in all the appropriate places, and bobbing hula dolls with lights that flashed red. Occasionally, there were orange and yellow flames painted as if coming from the engine. Some cars were muffler free, announcing their presence like roaring lions. The cars were products of a vocational arts program at Upland High School. My last stop was Rosa Gonzalez House. I watched her drop a tortilla on a glass gas flame and then nimbly flip it without burning her fingers. I could not imagine it possessed her to do such a thing. It made more sense when she dropped a spoonful of beans in the tortilla and then another spoonful of nopales. When I make a taco snack, I add a bit of cheese and a sprinkle of chili. Rosa was older than me. I was too young to recognize her beauty. She was always out of money. So I had to come back several times to get paid. I did not worry overly much because I knew what being broke was all about. My dad was often broke, but I, after Rosa got way, way behind, I stopped, stopped dropping newspapers on her porch. Many months after the newspaper supervisor handed me an envelope of cash. Pennies from heaven, Rosa paid her bill. So she was honest as well as beautiful. I remember Rosa's pleasant personality. I rode across the line from Los Olivos to the Anglo part of town. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. Loved it. Wonderful stories. This afternoon, um, you might have noticed there's Natalie popping into frame, also in San Francisco, and where she lives with her husband, Rick, and two cats. She will read two poems today, Missionary Church and Cyrano, which also originated in the Chronology Land Workshop. Welcome, Natalie. Good to see you. Thank you. The first one is Missionary Church, Eight Morn, Silent Plague Creeping, Seeping Through Veins, Unbeknownst, Legal Order, Shelter in Place, Too Late for Some, Death Takes Toll, Silent Pole, Angels Watch. And the second one is Cyrano. It's based on my childhood pet parrot named Cyrano. I once had an entertaining parrot called Cyrano de Bergia. I really want him back. He thought he was a hound dog. He was canting and swaying as he jumped up and down on his log. Thanks to Elvis, he was a class act. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you so much. All right, we are now at the end of the line here. We're up to our last reader for today. And that is Georgette Buckley who is on hand to read. Um, Georgette is a former coastal California artist 
who taught painting and attended archaeology lectures amongst Roman ruins, which sounds so wonderfully romantic and exotic, Georgette. She's going to close our poem today with a piece that originated in Alison Gifredo's creative writing workshop. Welcome, Georgette. I'm, I'm sorry, what workshop did you say? Oh, I anyway. said, no, no, I said Alison Gifredo's because that, that's what it said in the anthology. Was it a different one? Oh, this is from Selena's, uh, Selena's class. Okay. I, Good. I took Thank both her poetry and her writing class for a while. So that is no doubt my mistake. So I apologize for that. Thank you for okay. thank you for clarifying. All right. Uh, so one of the last conversations I had with Selena was after the uh, lockdown, and she asked how I was doing. And I said I'm fine, and then she, then I said as long as I don't see any zombie bunnies running around, <laughs> we'll be fine which was one of her short stories, which was very creative. So um, I think she would have enjoyed, enjoyed this uh, story. The Creature. In the last stage of birth, with one last excruciating push, a huge creature crawled out of me. My husband, children, midwife, and I stared in disbelief. It had a huge translucent gray shellfish back, kind of like an armadillo or shrimp. And were those tentacles? This baby must be over 20 pounds. Exhausted from a long grueling labor, motherhood guilt set in. Had my shrimp cravings caused this? It sputtered around the bedroom and walls and then leapt up and started nursing. I was repelled. This is, I am so not bonding with this strange unnamed thing. The creature jumped away as if knowing my thoughts. It jumped in, into the hands, but not the hearts of my children who ran away screaming. The extended family was already on the way. I cried in horror and disappointment. I let them observe for themselves. They all left speechless as if it was contagious. I never heard from them again. About three months later, I really needed to get out of the house. So I took the creature to the beach. It was off season, so stairs would be sparse. It enjoyed jumping frantically and shooting sand showers in a whirl. Then suddenly it dived into the ocean, splashing by instinct. Few surfers paddled away in terror. It came out digging and slurping up sand crabs like sushi. The young muscular lifeguard stood bewildered as the creature grew twice its size. With increased appetite, it started snatching and gulping any food left out by faraway picnickers. I had already packed up my belongings when it was in the ocean, thinking it had returned to its natural habitat. Unable to control it, I jumped into the car. Unfortunately, it jumped onto the back of the car and rode home with me. People pointed and swerved away from us. The creature had grown as tall as me by 12 months, still a total nightmare. Then, one night, it jumped on my back as I slept its tentacles puncturing me. I screamed in agony as my temperature rose and my devoted husband froze. Awoken and inspired, I typed on my tablet. Thank you all. Thank you, Georgette. Oh, wonderful. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm I just wrote in the chat, I'm, I really am honestly overwhelmed. I was not able to be at the library um, early in September for the live uh, reading, and I'm not even sure who all was there or wasn't able to make it. I know a few were, were too far, uh, but what a rich and inspiring, and I, I kind of feel like I just want to sit with it a little bit. It was, it was quite a, a, a wonderful way to spend an afternoon. So we're going to wrap things up with a goodbye and Katie's going to put us all on screen. We hope 
it shows for our audience as well. Um, she's working on that right now. Thank you, Nina. It has been incredible. So I, I have met some of you. Let's see. Let's get this gallery. Katie, does it show gallery for you? It does. Do you okay. see gallery? Um, I see it on our Facebook live feed too. So I wonder if everyone could just give a nice big smile like you're getting your picture taken. I'm going to do a <laughs> screenshot. One, two, three. Gorgeous. We got it. So thank you all for being here and sharing your beautiful stories and your beautiful hearts and minds and rich the riches of you thank you so much katie did you want to add anything to that just happy holidays happy thanksgiving and um the as a reminder the 2021 anthology is open for submissions so be sure to get your entries in and we'll see you all here next time very good thank you again thank you uh, uh, attendees for being here we're, we're glad you could make it all right everyone bye-bye